Well, this is the age of photography. Maybe a hundred years ago was age of painting or an age of, but this is the age of photography and now photography just gets more and more accessible. It's easier and easier to take uh, pictures. But the problem with that is people, although it's easier to take pictures, they take the same picture over and over. It's either portraits or documentary, but the very nature of what a photograph can be hasn't changed very much. In the, I demand more from photography than most people do. The photographer's idea of reality is a very small portion of reality. Up here is where my dreams are. Over here is where my desire is. Down here, you know, my desire is down here. Up here is where my fears and anxieties are. All of those are reality. But this is the only thing photographers ever photograph. They have to expect more from photography or from themselves. First I did photographs of people on the street and observations like everybody. And then I began to tell stories and expand the decisive moment to one, two, three, four, five moments. And then I began to write on photographs, which gave me, I couldn't put something in a picture that wasn't there in the first place. And then I began to do things which I call uh, deconstructed pictures, where I take a picture apart and put it back together in a new way. And now movies gives me all, you know, Garbo speaks, I can do anything, I can add, boy. And the possibility of failure increases. People play it very safe. They take this one picture over. How bad can it be? It could be a bad picture. I can fail as a storyteller. I could fail. Photography could be bad. You know, I, so it, it, the more I liberate myself to express myself, the more I liberate myself to fail. Failure is very important. I'm an expressionist. It's how well do I express myself. So if I express myself with a camera or with paint, it's all about the idea. Now, if your idea is, I'm just going to go around and photograph people's faces, that's fine. Okay, how risky could that be? Oh, that's a boring face. Oh, that's a beautiful face, you know. People make whole careers out of just photographing faces, and that's fine. But uh, I find life a little more interesting than that. And I'm, and I'm a little more curious about people than the way they look, you know. Well, I'm in a very peculiar place because I mentioned jokingly about my existential angst. But the thing is that, you know, I, my family, everybody dies 80 fix 87, 85, 80 fix 87. And I'm 87, so I'm in the ballpark. And in the background of all that is the, uh, is the truth of my impending not being. In other words, I'm, I'm gonna die. You know, I like to make it to 90. I don't know, but, um, so that, that throws a long shadow. So all my spiritual speculation and meditation and reading in Buddhism and, and uh, doing, you know, a lot of the work's been about the nature of death. My self-portrait with my guardian angel, photograph myself as if I were dead. Uh, spirit leaves the body. Death comes the old man. You know, I never solved the problem. It's, you know, people say that uh, Robert Ryman was, uh, what do they call that? He did white paintings forever. You know, he was, no, that's not, a, that's not a, an obsession, doing white paintings forever. It's a bad habit. Try blue. I mean, please, after the first thousand white paintings, you still haven't figured it out. So I tend to get hung up on subjects that are uh, more, a little more demanding. A lot of people, uh, you know, they'll say, well, they'll tell me an interesting project and they'll say, where's the effect? Well, I said, why didn't you do it? They said, what would people think? Who are these people you worried so much about what they're going to think, you know? It's ridiculous. And if there was an audience, why would I care what they thought? Well, that's this whole thing about Facebook and a thousand friends who love you. Nonsense. This whole country wants to be a... Uh, a cheerleader. Every, the whole country wants to be popular. You know, Mr. Popularity, you know. The ideal couple in high school, 10 years later, aren't so ideal. I began to move away from the still image out of the frustration with the still image. You know, I, look, I took a picture of you and I would show somebody the picture. And I said, well, that's a nice looking guy. Yeah, but 
what, what do I know about you from the picture? Nothing, really. You know, are you a crook? You know, are you beat your wife? I mean, you know, are you good in bed? I have no idea. So the mirror, your nose and your eyes, I don't care. But so how do I get beyond description? People, people believe photographs. And if you give them a photograph, they can't. As I said yesterday, that gives them a wonderful vehicle to play with people's perceptions. They seldom do it. They, again, they tell people what they already know. But if you contradict their perceptions, you can actually invent a story rather than looking for one, you know. And I love Bresson, I love Robert Frank, and what they did was great. But I'm not Robert Frank. Not a, so why do photographers always emulate somebody else's style or that they're not that person? One of the things that make art art or desirable is its uniqueness and its inaccessibility and its originality and its touch. Uh, and all these things are, in photography, are completely wiped out by iPhones. It's, that, all that's going. And not only is it going, it's going because people don't care about photography. They don't care about the perfect print. And that group will become smaller and smaller of uh, connoisseurs. But it's already phasing out. It's being destroyed by its own success. I did a book called Questions Without Answers, which is probably one of my favorite books. And I, the question, I used to tell my assistants years ago, we spent a lot of time together, why don't you ask me questions? And they never did. So then I said, well, I'll ask the questions. And the questions are very easy. What is life? What is death? What is God? What is humor? The fundamental things that we take for granted. And I, I had to figure out the answer. You know, like, who am I? That was really tough. I wrote. I seem to be what I seem to be what I am experiencing. That was interesting. I seem to be like right now I see my hand, I hear the noise, I hear the echo of my voice and ears, I feel the place where my ass is touching the chair, there's a nice breeze. I'm experiencing this. So I seem to be this event that's I am the experience calling itself Dwayne, you know. You have to provoke people into you have to demand that they get deeper and deeper, you know. Otherwise, it's always going to be looking at things. Oh, tits, ooh, oh, shiny thing, you know. And uh, our culture doesn't want you to think too deeply. Certainly in photography, it's so mesmerized and defined by mere observation. I said, when you bring insight into the observation is when you become the artist. To say, oh, this is a picture of my grandma. Okay, an old lady, so what? But if you were, this is a picture of my grandmother, and her, my grandfather was abusive, and she was probably the saddest woman I had ever known. Bow! Now we're talking. You know, up to then, it's description. But when I annotate, I, it's the annotation that makes the difference. Well, at some point, you became disillusioned what many, with what many of us do call the real world or history. And you had the idea of working with serial images. Mm -hmm. How did that originate and how did that evolve? Well, essentially came out of need for something to be expressed. And I realized the things that interested me weren't things that I would find on the street. And I would have to go out and make them happen myself. I was never a reportage person. I never, even today, I don't walk around with a camera hoping to find a wonderful accident. Uh, so it, became, it came out of the need to talk about things that really disturbed me, and the things that disturbed me were things that I consider very important, like what happens when you die, and what happened yesterday, and all those silly things that kids ask that we as grown-ups, because we know better, don't ask. But those are really the important questions that should be asked and never are, not just by photographers, by everybody. Everybody should ask, what the hell's going on here? So you've used your camera as a journal in which you record intimate thoughts, self-reflection, and very often philosophical musings. The only thing anybody knows for sure is what they experience. If you look at a photograph of somebody crying, you register grief. But in fact, you don't know what those people are experiencing at all. You're always projecting on the world your version of what that emotion is. So the what is known is only what I know. The only truth I know is my own experience. I don't know what it means to be black. I don't know what it means to be a woman. I don't know what it means to be Cartier Bresson. So I have to f define my work in terms of my own truth. And that's what the journey is all about. 
if you are true to your own instincts, and the great, the great wonder is that each one of us, you know, has its own, we have our own validity, we have our own mysteries, and it's the sharing of those gifts that makes artists artists. American photography has always dealt with going out and documenting reality or documenting some starving people or documenting the facade of a building, but it's very seldom dealt with the interior landscape. Social landscape was a very big number in the 50s, or I guess 60s, I don't remember anymore, but uh, my kind of photography has really been somewhat of a, a wolf in the hen house in the sense that uh, it's been in America. It's been not that much accepted. It's now it's accepted now, but I mean it's a relatively new notion that one would sit down and think about something and then make it happen, rather than looking for it. But my truth, the interior truth, ultimately is the only truth. When you are developing a work, can you tell us whether the words, the plot, or the image comes first in your mind? Actually, it's the chicken, or the egg. No, it really depends on the notion. Uh, most of all, I pay attention to my mind. We all have minds, and most people don't pay attention to their mind. Um, we're also distracted, incredibly distracted, by the noise of the culture. I mean, you can't walk down the street or turn on a television. I mean, the whole culture is designed to distract you, and maybe that's why I'm attracted to Eastern religions, because it, that really deals with the more of an interior dialogue. So I really work totally out of, out of my mind and my imagination. Do you think of yourself as a short story writer? Yeah, yeah. I feel like Cal Burnett. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, yes, I do. Uh, I, oh, that's right. That was a good question, too. I don't believe in categories, and I think that if the key word is expression. And if I want to express myself with photographs and writing, that's terrific. I don't believe in any rules, and I, I, I think that the rule makers are the people we have to watch out for. So I love the idea. Like now I'm painting with photographs and it's like, ex it's like discovering a muscle that you haven't used in 20 years. It's terrific. You made a reference to your interest in Eastern religion that mm -hmm. I would think is very relevant to your work and the way that you work. Not only your conviction that the unknown and the unseen is more real than so-called reality, but the very premeditation of what you do and I wonder if you would tell us if it is in any way linked to either your Catholic upbringing mm. or your current more meditative commitment to Buddhism well I always say that I'm a professional photographer and a dilettante mystic and I would much prefer to be a professional mystic and a dilettante photographer but there's still time <laughs> whatever but I really yeah uh, I was brought up a Catholic and I was a very heavy Catholic I used to make a culpa all the time and I finally um, outgrew it I simply I simply asked too many questions and the answers I that they were giving me didn't fit anymore and I'm very much attracted to Eastern religions because they don't give you answers in that same sense they really ask questions and I think photographs should not give you answers. I think photographs should ask questions. Photographs should not tell me what I already know. Photographs should contradict me. I think you've suggested that a photograph was nothing but illusion. And not only that, you've also suggested that the only reality is light. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm thinking fair or accurate? Photographers are always describing the package very well, but they never talk about the content. They show me what a person looks like, they show me the what of things, but they don't show me the why or the how of things. You are not what you appear to be. I'm not the, I'm just, none of us are what we appear to be. Nothing is what it appears to be, but we're so used to this, we don't see it anymore. Photographers are always looking, but they don't really see anything. Probably one of your best known images is a photograph that was taken in 1975 called A Letter From My Father. Right. And even to the casual viewer, the photograph becomes a repository of painful memories. And obviously it has all sorts of private and very emotional meanings to you. Did you write the caption at the time the photograph was taken? Can you tell us anything about the genesis of that picture? Yeah, that's one of my favorite, it means a great deal to me. Um, my father died in 1975, and I had taken the photograph in 1960. It's a picture of my mother and my father and my brother. And um, it's actually a truth situation. My, when I left home at 17, my dad always said he was going to write me a letter, but he never did. 
And so I kept saying, well, when are you going to write the letter? And finally, when he retired, I kept saying, now you have all this time on your hands, you know, where's the letter? And um, he never did write it, but it became a big joke. We used to sort of joke about it. He said, I'm going to write it. And so when he died, that was my instant response to it, you know, to deal with it that way. The photograph by itself is one experience, but the photograph with the text is quite another experience. I think an important work always has the sense of the individual in it. And uh, you look at Paul Clay, you look at Atcha, you know that nobody else would have done that. That's what's so wonderful about it. There's the power in the artist's work. It's that sense of, of his vision, and, and you're moved by it. It's extraordinary. You used the phrase before that you like when your assumptions are upset. Is that yeah. correct? When I'm contradicted, or when every, the only way I've ever grown is when, when all of my definitions have been uh, contradicted. You see, people believe photographs, too. They don't believe paintings, which gives a, phot a photographer an enormous weapon because he can, it's a wonderful vehicle to contradict people's assumptions because if you do something in a photograph that doesn't happen in real life, the fact that it's a photograph is very disturbing. Uh, so I was always jealous of painters because they could really make people, uh, Magritte could have people raining out of the sky, and I simply couldn't do that. And so I realized that if I could paint, then maybe I could have another, another thing I could do. And, um, so that's what's happening. I'm teaching myself how to paint after 30 years, and I find it scary as hell, but wonderful. Do you think of yourself as a surrealist? I don't really think of myself that way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about anything about labels. Uh, I don't think of myself in those terms. I just think about the work. I just think about what I'm doing at the moment. That's what I think about most of all. You see, I think if you have to put up with, the, with all the limitations of the camera, then you should the photographer should use everything that the camera can do, and certainly one of them is blurring and double exposing. I find it's very useful because people in real life do not blur or double expose unless you're drunk. You come from a small town in Pennsylvania, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, from a Slovak family. Your name, Dwayne Michaels, certainly would not reveal that, but you yourself have created a Slovak working class alter ego called Stefan Mihal. Stefan. Excuse me, Stefan yeah. Mihal. I think that there are some people who find themselves, you know, at half past 68, going on 69, don't even know that they're alive, have no idea. The whole question of who's sitting in this chair talking right now? Where do these ideas come from? How did this occur? What combination of events made this happen? I think it's extraordinary, and I think that all of us have an alter ego. He's the person we never became. Think of Think of the total opposite of you. Um, in my case, it would be somebody who is, who loves football, who loves, oh, I like to drink beer, but that's not good, but who likes to drink too much beer, who's married and has seven kids, who works in a factory, uh, who still does this a lot. Um, the person who you are not, it's like matter and antimatter. If I should meet him on the street, we'd probably blow up. I mean, we're complete opposites. For some artists, the medium itself is the end. It seems to me that for you, the technique or the tool is not quite so essential to your vision. Well, the mind is essential to my vision, and um, uh, the technique follows. I mean, I assume you know how to, I, I assume that one can focus a camera and if you can drive a car, you can take photographs. I mean, it doesn't take, there's no, the mystique of the camera is something that always amazes me because I think photographers tend to hide behind it. You know, the F64 and, um, you know, all the stuff. What kind of equipment do you use or does it matter? Well, I use Nikons and I wish they'd, you know, I just said that on television, they should give me some money or something. Uh, I use Nikons, I'm not an equipment nut. I think that you should know your equipment and forget about it. It's like, it's like uh, as if a group of writers, can, can you see, uh, could you see Joyce and Steinbeck and Hemingway all sitting around comparing typewriters? You know, you ought to see my Olivetti, my, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's, where do you see mine? It's electric, you know. Do you think that photography is art? Sometimes, and sometimes art is an art. That's the basic mistake of photographers, the whole notion that without those rocks and trees and funny looking people standing on the corner eating carrots with American flags, they wouldn't have a picture to take. And they completely bypass this inc 
this incredible thing that we are, the mind. The best part of us is not what we see, it's what we feel. We are what we feel, we're not what we look at. And when, when, and when these eyes close, it's all over. So we're not our eyeballs, we're our mind. People believe they're eyeballs, and he's totally wrong. If he, what would he do if he, if he really had to just sit in a room and think of the kind of wonderful things he would create? Photography is the only field. All the other art forms are based on the imagination. I guess now I have to ask you the inevitable question. What next? What do you be, expect to be doing next year, 10 yeah. years from now? I don't know. That's what's so exciting about it. I, I wouldn't limit myself to any possibilities, and I have no idea what I'll be doing next year. Probably more painting. I feel sorry for people who know exactly what they're going to be doing next year. The same thing they did five years ago. But how wonderful to have all your options, especially when you're older. When you're a kid, it doesn't make any difference. The whole world's sitting there, and you're 21, and oh boy. But to be 48, and oh boy, that's a trick, and, and that's wonderful. What are you working on now? Well, it's the painted pieces and the drawings. Um, which is wonderful because um, it's so difficult and scary and I can make a total fool of myself and uh, I think it's very important always to be living on the edge where it's always possible when you're not quite sure what this is about that's the excitement you know? all during the course of our conversation you have been very straightforward in fact even courageous in articulating your own personal ideas and preoccupations and one of your central concerns is the whole notion of human awareness. I wonder if you would agree with that assessment and you'd, if you'd care to comment on it. Oh, absolutely. But if there's some way that we could understand that being alive is simply not a matter of consuming things and using, and using deodorants. It really is a matter of being a walking, talking, once-in-a-lifetime offer in the universe that's never going to appear again. I mean, all those wonderful combinations that made me and not Stefan that came together that produced this instant will never happen again. And this is only 30, maybe 60, 70, 80 years, which is nothing in time. And we don't even see it. We are so dead, you know. And, and somehow beyond photography, maybe I use the photography somehow to explain to myself, to remind me that I'm alive. So let's, let's have some going, something happening, something touching, because this is the moment. Watch. See, this is now. We, 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 this is now, right? No, it's not, because this is actually now. No, no, this is really now. That was not now. The minute you say now there is, have you ever paid attention? Oh, that's the great thing, paying attention. It's, see, photographers look, but they don't pay attention. They're looking and they see what, exactly what they expect to see. Don't tell me what I know, or don't tell me what snow looks like. Don't tell me what tits look like. Don't tell me what cars look like. Tell me what I don't know. And the only thing I don't know is what you know, and that's what artists should do. They should give me the secret. You should give the secret your own secret. We have secrets. There are secrets you've never even told your lover. There are secrets we have and your poetry and your art and lies in your vulnerability and your vulnerability lies in your secrets and that's where you want to go. But first you have to be courageous enough to say that. Pay attention to your mind. Most people don't even know they have a mind. They have no idea. And then what kind of a mind do you have? But you do. Everything you see, everything you feel, everything you think is in your mind. It's in your brain. You're upside down what you see. So and so find out what kind of a mind you have. Some people have stupid minds, lazy minds, but I have a very interesting mind, he said, modestly. No, but what my mind, when I say something, I hear two or three spin-offs. You know, when I say like, uh, I'm a little horse, I think of Princess Anne, I think of Sea Biscuit. I have, so when I make a statement like that last sentence, I, I hear two or three other, and I think that's where my creativity lies because I'm always dipping to that well, and it always just, well, that, you know who that was? That was Jack Benny. But I'm always, see, my mind just said that. So I'm just telling you, you have a mind. You put shit in your mind, you're going to have a shitty life. Nobody's the, you're the blame. Nobody makes you do that. Well, I do, what do you mean? Fuck you, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. What? Huh? What? Huh? Yeah. Anyway, so they asked me to, oh, anyways, about description. Now, if you photograph something, that shows you what it looks like. But I want to know what it feels like. So if I see a woman crying, I want to know what grief, I did a book called Questions Without Answers, where I answered all these questions, what is grief? No, but it's that curiosity. This is called Things Are Queer, because this you have to understand that all the logic we have has been human logic. 
It has nothing to do with the abs absolute nature of the way the world functions. And you're going to be so surprised when you die if there's no heaven and no hell. And because you put all of that in your head, according to Bet Tibetans, if you believe in heaven and hell, you're going to get pitchforks up like a zoo and all that kind of stuff because you're all sinners, so you're all going to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh up the kazoo. <laughs> no, that's heaven. Now, okay, this is called Things Are Queer. You see, I used to think of time as being horizontal. And if I look straight ahead, I could make out the outlines of this coming weekend. And if I look behind me, I could make out the outlines of last weekend. But now I can hardly make out the outlines of yesterday morning or tomorrow morning. But it's, guess when I was born? Remember I said there's no now when you say now? I was born now. And when I was in the Army, it was now. And when I was at DU, it was now. And now it's now. And guess when I'm going to die? I'm going to die now. But the minute you say it's now, it's not now. Our lives have been just one now, one, only one moment called now, which as a sequence we have stretched into this because of the nature of the rules of this particular universe. We have stretched into befores and afters, but if you examine it, there's never been anything else but now, and that's all there is. Can I go now? <laughs> the most beautiful part of a woman's body, in the oldest dreams of old men, women's breasts still remain, Long after their desire have turned, desires have turned to dust, they are their first memories, warm, nurturing home, the point of satisfaction. Perfect in their gracious arcs, women wear their breasts as medals, emblems of their love. All things mellow in the mind, a sleight of hand, a trick of time, and even our great love will fade, soon we'll be strangers in the grave. That's why this moment is so dear. I kiss your lips and we are here. So let's, uh, let's hold tight and touch and feel. For this quick instant, we are real. The New York Times asked me to do a self-portrait, and I did a picture. Who cares what I look like? But I did a picture of, of reading, because I'm a big reader, and I wrote, I think about thinking. And that's who I really am. So all these portraits of somebody are really about vanity and have nothing to do with the, what the person essentially is. And that's what this is about. If you could photograph what a person's about, not what they look like, that's a whole other thing. My father could walk on the sky, in the sky. He promised to teach me how, but he left without saying goodbye. I don't cry. I'm a grown-up now. And uh, that's me in the mirror. That's my mother on the, le on the uh, left. And uh, that's my grandmother. She died six months later. And that's my grandfather. He died uh, maybe a year or so later. This is the old dining room today. And uh, that's m my grandma, they're dead, and my mother and father, and that's my brother Tim. And uh, that's his daughter, who, who I hope is in the audience. She lives in Columbine. Uh, that's my Tim and Ann, and that's m my two nieces. And I, I'll tell you what I know. Father lived incognito in his own house. He was a stranger to his spouse. Jack worked three shifts in Mr. Carnegie's mill for little pay and smoked three packs of camels every day. Camels were his best friends until they betrayed him in the end. Mother was a good man. Mother said he was a good man and a good provider. Between mother and me, he was always the outsider. When he was told that he had been cuckolded, Father went from an amateur drinker to a professional, and mother took to her confessional. Once I saw him cry, I never thought to ask why. He was already a ghost when he died. It pains me to write this. He was not missed. Wow, that's terrible. That's a terrible thing to say, but I'll tell you what it is. It's real. It's true. It's no bullshit. It's not for any gallery. It's not for Sotheby's. It's not for MoMA. That's the stuff. That's the stuff. And if you're not going to do that, if you're not have the courage to write your own fucking truth, then, then sell shoes. <laughs> but I'm full. Everything with me starts with an idea. I, I very seldom uh, walk around and see something and decide that that's a photograph. This is actually about death. I have come back to death from so many angles. And um, it's about a young man who kills a fly. And he suddenly has this moment when he realizes he's killed something. 
So it goes from that idea and then writing it. And it was such a simple idea, and I kept toying with it. And then in the end, it said, uh, it was just a fly. I, and then I changed it. It was only a fly. And I changed it. It was just a fly. Well, the first few frames is, you know, it, 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 who hasn't tried to kill a fly? <laughs> you know, they, they don't stand still. And they see this shadow coming toward them, and they take off. So it's him chasing the fly, and then, and, uh, and then eventually catching it and killing it. And when he does, I, I told him, be sure you have this moment of triumph on your face. A little, ah, you know, I gotcha. And he suddenly has this moment of, which probably passed in, in a second. He's killed something. All the writing and all of the sequences and everything I've ever done has come out of with frustration with the stillness of the still camera. You know, um, being boxed in by the camera. So somehow I had to circumvent the stillness and because I wasn't wedded to the purity of a camera, I just began to write. I, I really do write C Dick, C Chain, C Spot, and um, but sometimes to reduce a feeling uh, to a sentence is very hard, and it's such a pleasure um, when you do it. Death comes the old lady. I had my father, Blurry, walk in the room, and there's this woman, old lady, and he touches her on the shoulder. And then I had her stand up, and, and luckily she was so old that when she moved very slowly, I got a magnificent blur. It was as if her atoms were, you could see them, just going out into space. She looks at a coat, she opens it up, it's empty. She falls asleep, and then the coat comes alive and runs away with her. It would be very hard for me to do that in one photograph. But then again, it, there's no point to doing six pictures if the last, if you don't arrive someplace differently than when you started. It has to take you someplace. We live in our emotions. The visual part of us is a small piece of this enormous pie called reality. And photographers kept limiting themselves to that little portion of the pie. And I said, now we have to expand the definition of reality to include the whole experience. We spend a third of our lives dreaming. What's more real to you than your own dreams? And when you're dreaming them, you believe they are real. Why aren't dreams a subject for photography? It's because photographers only photograph what they can see. So then I had to invent other ways using photography like double exposures, uh, sequences, little mini stories like haiku, anything, you know, sandwich negatives, blurs, anything that destroyed the nature of reality. What I like about double exposures is, first of all, you can't see what you're doing. I have to have it in my head. You're taking a picture that you can't see, creating something in reality that's not there. People believe reality. They believe photographs. It gives you a, it gives you a weapon to play with their perceptions.
My first museum show was at the Museum of Modern Art in 1970. And having showed at the Museum of Modern Art gets you a lot of attention. And um, one thing just led to another. I was the first one to write with photographs. I ran into a friend of mine who taught at the School of Visual Arts, and he said, um, but students are very curious that you're writing with photographs. They're saying that your photographs are so bad that you have to write to explain them. And he said, what should I tell the students? I said, tell them in another five years they're all going to be writing on photographs. Talk about what's about. I call myself an expressionist. Uh, it's not about writing, it's not about photography, it's not about tap dancing or painting, it's about how well do you express yourself in terms of your needs. So that means I'm not wedded to the camera, I, I'm, I'm not wedded to writing, I'm not wedded to any of these things. For me, life is here. So for me, reality are my dreams, my anxieties, my memories, and so I don't, I could sit in this room here and invent, that's what I do actually, I don't go looking for pictures, I wait for them to appear in my mind.